Okay, happy Monday. Today's Rosh Chodesh Elul. King is in the field. What does a king in the field mean? I hope the Rebbe explains. The month of Elul was the time when Moses was beseeching God, praying to God to restore the relationship just as it was before the sin of the golden calf. Not only restore it to the perfectly, but it should become even stronger. Much like if you cut a rope, and then you retie the two pieces and you form a knot, you become the, the ropes actually become closer and tighter and stronger. The bond is much greater. So these uh, this was a period of time where God was forgiving the Jewish people and becoming closer to the Jewish people. And, and that was eliciting his 13 midas harachmi, yud gimel midas harachmi, his 13 attributes of mercy. And they're shining right now. Seemingly, the whole month should be a time of, uh, should be a holiday, because God, a high revelation of godliness is being experienced at this moment. Just like every holiday, the reason why we don't work and do certain things is because if you're standing in front of the king, who's going to work? You're not going to work. You're going to serve the king. On Shabbos, and Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Pesach. So seemingly the whole month of El should be a time where we don't work. That's the advantage of the month of El, that God is coming to us, or he's accessible in a way that we can come as we are. Yeah, we don't have to be all dressed up and in our, acting in our perfect, se- perfect selves. You can come as you are, as you normally would, in the field, on the streets, walking down the street, walking in your backyard. You can come to God, and God will greet you. The King will greet you as a, as one of His own, as a uh, as a partner, as a friend. You can talk to the King and really, really bond and and make the relationship strong and healthy and fun, so that when you come to Rosh Hashanah, you're like old pals meeting up and and uh, asking for what you need, pouring in God. Telling God over exactly what he wants to hear um, on Rosh Hashanah, and ultimately you'll get what you want. As we know, how do you how do you access this? The Yud Gimel Midas Rachamim. How do you get God on your side? How do you access the field? So the Rebbe says there's a concept in Chassidus called an Isus Lovasata, caused in this Isarusa de la Ela. That when you put an effort here below, God reciprocates. And how do we, uh, what do you, however you act is how God will act towards you. Like Gemara says that if you, if people call you a friend, then God will call, will come to you as a friend. If people call you a brother, God will act to you as a brother. So by emulating the king, says the Rebbe, that the king is greeting everybody with a joyous face. He's receiving everybody with a joyous face and showing a smiley countenance. You know, very joyful and graceful by you emulating that to other people, anyone and everyone, just as the king is right now. I don't care what you've done, who you are, what kind of schmutz and garbage you're in right now. If you're willing to come to me, I'm going to embrace you with open arms. If you act like that during the month of Elul, says God, says the Rebbe, and God will reciprocate in the same fashion. I'll give you a little life hack over there on how to uh, reach uh, access these 13 meters of Rachman. You should really take advantage. It's good that you're coming to the class. You're learning. You're thinking about this, meditating upon these concepts. Meditating means just you think about it from time during the day, from time to time. You think, how does this apply to my life? Very practically into my life. As we know, Devarim, the book of Devarim, which is what we're in, the Chumash Devarim, Parsha Shaitim, which I'll get to in a moment. Devarim means word saying it over twice deber means to speak and speaking it over twice it's in the plural form why the plural form because Torah should not just be said the way god says it but you should say it a second time in your own language to yourself how it applies to yourself in your matziv and your situation just as moses was doing here in the whole book he's saying that the if you look the words are much more difficult um, voca- we're introduced to vocabulary words that we've never seen before. Um, Moses speaking in such a first-person way, that's the, God wants us to emulate that. 
the lesson is that you have to speak Torah. Torah has to be spoken in your language, in our language, speaking to you. So with that, let's open up. We're in Parsha Shoifkin, nearing the end of the book. Um, we won't actually end it until Simchas Torah, because right for the next four weeks we have. Um, we'll do some Parshias for the next four weeks. But then we have Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, the first days of Sukkot. So we're not going to actually complete the Torah for another, you know, two month and a half. But uh, we're only a few Parshias away. And we've only got like three or four more Parshias left. Or four. All right. So the Parsha of Shaftim opens up with the laws of setting up courts. And I think some of this will seem kind of familiar because you live here in America. Seems like they uh, copied, emulated, copied, uh, copied the way we, or the way God set it up. So traditionally, we had three levels of courts. We have courts made up of three people, which are courts still till today. We have courts of twenty-three and courts of seven, and one court of seventy-one, and that was called the Sanhedrin. That uh, in the times of Moses, there were seventy elders. And Moses himself, that was 71. In the times of Mordechai, there was, there's the person who's the head of the court system, and, and which in that case, that was Mordechai. I mean, that was Moses. In the times of Mordechai, it was Mordechai himself. Um, so what is the three, the sets of three? So what are the courts of three? What do they deal with? Mainly torts. And we still deal with it. We still deal with it today. Lawsuits, um, mainly lawsuits, because in America, they recognize the, uh, anything to do with arbitration, really. It's, you know, just they see it as like an arbitration court. And it holds that if you come to a Jewish court and you have uh, some sort of lawsuit and you bring it to a Jewish court, which you're supposed to do at first, and the rabbis issue a ruling, the, the, the American court system will recognize that and enforce that. That's very much enforceable. So uh, it, they also used to deal with assault and battery. Um, I think, um, you know, what else did they deal with? Uh, whatever, man, assault and battery, more like um, physical issues, you know, along those lines. But obviously we don't do that anymore because they have no real way of enforcing it. That's the problem. I mean, that's part of it. There's no way, there's no way to enforce it. But uh, divorce and marriage, those are all done through a court system. Now, the, uh, through the court of three, even till today. Now, what's the 23? The 23, they were all over the land of Israel and they dealt with capital punishment. Capital punishment, that was their main thing. In addition to any other ruling that the lower court system could not reach a conclusion to, or if you wanted to appeal, right? There was an idea of appealing, you can appeal. Now, it's not as I think much like the American court system, you have to have proper, you have to introduce new evidence or whatnot, um, but you could appeal to the court of 23. And if the court of three did, couldn't reach a conclusion, they would go to the court of 23. And actually that's what the Torah will open up with. The court of 23 can only exist as long as there is a Sanhedrin, a Sanhedrin, a court of, of 71, because they have to keep the courts of 23 in line. Um, yeah, they can't go around killing people indiscriminately or, or whatnot. The, the bottom line is the Torah just says you have to have the court of 71. Now, the court of 71, they were the ones up until the times of Hillel and Shammai, uh, which were the second temple era towards the end, I believe, uh, middle towards the end, they dealt with all laws of Judaism. Anytime there was an issue, uh, tribes between tribes going to war, yeah, much like you need the approval of Congress in our court system and our, our checks and balances system. Um, and any issue of that dealt with the Jewish people. So uh, establishing the calendar. When is Rosh Hashanah going to be? Remember, it's not like today where we have it all established. Then it was based off of witnesses coming to say we saw what was called the molid, the little period of time where the, the moon has become new, right? Rosh Chodesh is when it's a new moon. In other words, at some point, the moon becomes completely invisible. You can't see it. The sun does not shine on the moon. 
it's only and if it's only that only happens for a brief moment and then you see a little bit of the moon shining once again and that's called the molid molid means birth rebirth of the moon that's a new month so that was established by the sanhedrin um now let's um maybe i'll tell some interesting things at around the year 30 ce um the court system wanted to stop capital punishment um so in other words they felt that maybe perhaps too much bloodshed was going on now it's very very difficult to be sentenced to death by a court you know when it says like oh if you break shabbos you're going to be killed the, they say if a court put someone to death more than once in 70 years it was considered a severe court, like a, you know, a, a, a court that sheds blood. So, you know, here, think about it in like, you know, Florida or something where they put people to death like every month. So there, if you put someone to get once every 70 years, it was considered a very harsh court. And the Sanhedrin would really investigate what's going on over there. And at a certain point, the Sanhedrin felt that um, we want to remove that power from the lower courts. And from the court of 23 to be able to do that. All courts should be putting people to death like that um, for whatever reason. Um, I guess they just felt it was too harsh. It was too much going on. So what they did was the Sanhedrin moved away from the Temple Mount. The Sanhedrin would meet inside the base of Mikdash, inside the temple. They would have the, in the chamber of hewn stone is what it's called. As long as they this, if, as long as they didn't meet there, therefore the, the court of 23 could not establish itself and carry out capital punishment. So where did the, the Sanhedrin go? The Sanhedrin went to right below the Temple Mount. They went like right outside the Temple Mount. So they would continue to meet and discuss legal issues, much like the, they were the Supreme Court. So they would discuss legal issues. Um, but all the while they were in that place, they could not... Um, they could not carry out capital punishment. Um, now, the parsha opens up. I'm just looking over here with a azakin mamri. Azakin mamri means like a, a like a rebellious elder. <laughs> what happened over here? There was a lower, like I said before, there was a lower court, the court of three, or the court of twenty-three. If they couldn't reach a conclusion to a certain ruling, they would go. To the higher court system. So if they were a court of three, they'd go to 23. If it was a court of 23, they'd go to the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, the court of 71. If the older person, meaning the elder, meaning the, the wisest of the court, uh, went and he got a ruling, he went to the older courts, the higher, the upper court system, um, and they told him what to do, and he came back and he said, we're not going to do it, it would smack him around a little bit. You can't do that. You're called a rebellious elder. You're not allowed to, if you have to accept their opinion, no matter what, you, even if you feel differently. Um, so just, you know, just imagine once again, up until the times of Shammai and Hillel, the court functioned perfectly. Court of 71, everything was ruled according to the court of 71. Now what happened was around 1 CE, about 2000 years ago, the Romans came in, and the Romans really wanted to uh, break apart the Jewish people's way of life. They wanted to, you know, to they wanted to uh, impose their culture, which we still have till today. And but they didn't want to go. I don't exactly know how they did it, but they didn't want to like go all out. They wanted to win the hearts of the Jewish people. So you're not going to go in there and and start. To, uh, eventually they did, but. They're not going to go in there and, you know, fire and brimstone, act like slaves. You're going to have to do what we say. The Romans were much more smart about it. They said, let's try to slowly um, ruin their, their way of life, so to speak. So what did they do? One of the first things they did, break down their way of life. One of the first things they did was break up the Sanhedrin. They said the Sanhedrin can't meet as often as it does. I don't exactly know how they did that. But well, that's what they said. They made a certain ruling. But the Sanhedrin started meeting very infrequently, the court of 71. What did that do? What that ended up doing was creating academies. 
when you look inside the Mishnah, especially in the Gemara, you'll see one person says like this, another person says like this. The house of this, base Hillel, says like this. Beis Shammai, the house of Shammai, says like this. Rabbi Gamliel says like this. Rabbi Yeshua says like this. Rabbi Akiva says like this. What, what do you mean? Like, well, how did, like, what's going on over here? Who is saying where? Where are they? What's going on? So much like today, you have different yeshivot, yeshivas, and everybody has sort of a different way, a different approach to Judaism, a different emphasis. They feel that this generation needs to emphasize on this part of the Torah. Perhaps it's, uh, we need to live more secluded, or we need to live more outward, we need to focus on loving a fellow Jew, or we need to focus on the land of Israel, specifically, um, to the detriment of other areas of Judaism, perhaps even the more focus on Torah study and academia, intellectualism, while another one is more on prayer and um, arousing the emotions and being a, like a warm and, and a light, you know, more of a light than sitting in a corner and being gathering knowledge and being a genius. So everybody had their own. That's called, they're different academies. They call them houses. But what happened is because it's unhappy to meet and therefore people, there was always questions. Just like you always have questions. I always have questions, halachic questions, hadracha, you know, ways of life. You always have questions and that's good. Judaism very much wants you to have questions. It's very important. In fact, it's uh, extreme. It's probably one of the most important things you could possibly do. That's questions. It's the only way you're going to learn. But since the Sanhedrin couldn't meet and everybody couldn't, the Supreme Court couldn't meet and therefore they couldn't bring their questions to them. So what happened was <coughs> the great scholars opened up their own academies. Now, <coughs> they opened up their own academies and so therefore you had different opinions. For example, Hillel allowed anybody to come to his academy. Anybody and every, everybody that wanted to come to his academy was allowed to come. Shammai, on the other hand, only wanted the elite. You had to be very intelligent to come to his academy. Interestingly enough, Hillel and Shammai themselves only disagreed about three uh, on three subjects, three three uh, three halakhic issues. But what happened was Hillel and Shammai ultimately passed away. What we call we call Nifter and Nistalik, and so their academy still continued. Now. Their um, Hillel and Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, the Academy of Hillel and the Academy of Shammai, let's say like, uh, you know, 50, 60 years later, they would be arguing over everything. They are, I mean, very often they disagree. And one, Hillel always took a more liberal approach, the House of Hillel versus the House of Shammai, which took a very strong and intellectual and cold approach, so to speak, which was reflected in the fact that by the, the fact that Hillel's the cat based Hillel, the Academy of Hillel allowed anybody. So therefore, you know, it was much more liberal and there was a lot more opinion going on to accommodate so much more as, a, as opposed to Shammai. You can imagine the type of person that's just, it's this way, you're my way or the highway. It's just like this, that we know what the truth is and that's it. We don't bend left or right. Not to say that the house of Hillel would bend the truth. They didn't do that. And there were many arguments. And the question is, what is the rule for the Jewish people as a whole? So the Gemara, in, the Gemara says, I believe in Erevin, that a baskol, yeah, it's very often you'll see a, vo a heavenly voice came out and said, we rule according to base Hillel. However, when Mashiach comes, we will be able to appreciate and we'll all be on the level of Shammai and we will follow the, the laws of base Shammai. But until then, we follow the laws of Hillel. And that's why you have many different opinions and different people who hold by different halakhic rulings, even till today. You know, we, you can see the Sephardim act a certain way, the Ashkenazim, even with the Ashkenazi communities, even with the Sephardic, within the Sephardic communities, people follow different ways because different traditions were held on from different academies and they, you know, they uh, unraveled or they, um, whatever, they, they, people held on to those. Whatever it was, they had a tradition to hold on to that. That was that came their custom. That was their minhag, and you don't you don't do otherwise. Um, now the Gemara says, I mean the Torah says that you listen to the you listen to the uh, courts at all costs. If they tell you 
left is right and right is left, you listen to what they have to say. Now, what does it mean? Which means, what does that mean? According to the Abar Benel, and this is the mainstream, of, and everyone accepts this opinion, if you know for sure something else, yeah, they issue a ruling, but you know with certainty that's not true. However you know, you're the only one there. But you know with certainty that's not true. You still must listen to the courts. And the Gemara has numerous examples of, uh, of this. Now, I, the Arbar Benel actually gives a certain, uh, one certain, um, he says, he explains like this. He gives an example. There's something called Hamait Mechaveroi Olav Haraya. If you want to take money from somebody else, the burden of proof is on the one who wants to take the money away. We hold that a, uh, yeah, so let's say I, I, you, uh, I, you owed me money. You owed me money. And I go to the court and um, I say, this person still, uh, um, still owes me money. The court will say that um, we're going to side with the person who still has the money. So in other words, we're not going to take money from that person. Because the rule is, the general rule is, a person doesn't pay their debts. Um, you owe me money. <laughs> the one who wants to take money away from another person, the, per the burden is on the person that wants to take the money away. So I say to you, you owe me money. The court's going to say, okay, you have to prove it. Until you prove it, the money stays with that person. Because... A person doesn't pay his debts early. Yeah, we, uh, um, actually, that's not exact. What the bottom line is, I don't have to take money from that person. If the court goes ahead and says they have an inkling and they say and they think they feel that I'm right, even though they don't have strong proof, but they feel that I'm right, they'll take the money away from you and give it to me. That's what the that's what the Abarbanel explains that even though we have these general principles that Hamaytsi that normally the, the, the court would side with you and you don't have to pay me anything. If they have an inkling, they have some sort of feeling that it's not true, that you uh, that it is true. What I'm saying is true, that you do owe me money, they can force you to have money. So even though what's normally left is right, yeah, nobody's left is left. But if they decide left is right today, then you have to follow what they do. And a, a, a much more famous example is, is like this. There was, a Gemara, there was an incident between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Gamliel said that Yom Kippur, according to his calculation, is going to fall out on a Tuesday. I don't exactly know which day it was. Rabbi Yeshua said, no, I think it's going to fall out on a, um, it's going to fall out on a Tuesday. And Rabbi Yeshua said, I think it's going to fall out on a Monday. And the court and the, the majority opinion followed Rabbi Gamliel, that really it's going to be on Tuesday. That is when Yom Kippur is. Now imagine Rabbi Yeshua. He thinks that Monday, he feels with all the conviction that Monday is going to be Yom Kippur. Rabbi Gamliel asked Rabbi Yeshua, on Monday, the day that you think is Yom Kippur, I want you to walk with walk to my house, which is more than 2,000 Amas, carrying a stick, which you're not allowed to carry on Shabbos, um, and daven the regular prayer that we're going to do to prove, to uphold this statement that you that you follow the majority opinion, you follow the, the opinion of the Supreme Court. And that's what he did. Rabbi Shua, you imagine on Monday, he thinks it's Yom Kippur. He believes in it with all of his fiber and being that it's Yom Kippur. And he's going and he's carrying and he's turning on lights and he's doing everything like that to uphold the, um, that we follow the Sanhedrin, we follow the court's opinions, uh, the rabbi's opinion. Um, despite what you think. And that's what this passage means, that when they tell you to go right, you go, they tell you left is right, and right is left, that's what you do. You follow their opinion. Okay. Um, so I just thought, just to mention today, we say Mishnah, and the Empirical Yavas in the Mishnah says, say l'charav. You should, get, you should make for yourself a rav. Everybody has to have a rav, a rav, a halachic authority, a person that um, you can ask a dracha, ways of life, a mentor, 
not just a mentor, a person who knows halacha, you have to ask them, what's the proper path for me? What is What should I do in this opinion? Now, there are many opinions within halacha. The more halacha you learn, you'll see that there are multiple opinions. Now, there's an accepted opinion, a majority accepted opinion, and then there are less accepted opinions. It could be, and it happens, that a lesser accepted opinion could apply to you. The Arav could tell you, you the, there is a better option, that there's a more ideal option, option what's called lichat chila, from the outset you should do it like this. But if you can't do it like that, in other words, I, I assessed your, your situation, your environment, and I think you should follow this opinion until you're ready to do this other opinion. Um, that, that's the importance of having a rub. And it comes into play very often, um, you know, with family situations, traveling abroad, family, uh, you know, kids, what can I do for my kids, what do for myself? Yeah, I have a guest, I want to act like this, I don't act like that. So you have to have a rub. Um, now, you, it should be one Rav, but if after a while you feel that this Rav, I've maybe perhaps moved on spiritually from this Rav, this Rav likes to just give a very, you know, lenient opinion, let's say, or a very strict opinion. I don't, I'm not holding by it, where that Rav is telling you to hold, you can switch. You can switch a Rav, but you have to stick it out for a while. That's the halacha. You should pick a Rav, and you have to have a Rav, and usually a Rav, um, uh, so there's a rabbi. Who knows? Yeah, he knows a lot of, he knows a lot of, hopefully he knows a good amount of Torah, knows a good amount of Allah, Jewish law. But then there's a rab, a judge, a one who issues, um, can extrapolate from the Torah, extrapolate from law. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about that level. They have what's called Dayanis, where uh, they have, they have, they're a judge. Um, so in our shul, we have, let's say, three or four rabbis, myself included, and then we have a rab. And he's actually the rab of, all of Detroit. Um, and after a while, if you feel like this rub is not for you, it should be someone from your community or close to your community. You feel that it's not proper, that you're not the, you, should, you can switch after that. I actually heard that from the rub himself. <laughs> um, now, the, even this, um, the idea that you should follow left and right and right is left, that even explains that um, when the rabbis make a new well, yeah, when we, whenever we say, like, the rabbis say this, the rabbis say that, who are the rabbis that we're talking about? We're talking about the rabbis of the Sanhedrin or the rabbis of these academies. Now, the rabbis established something like Hanukkah. How can we say on Hanukkah, Baruch Hashem Malachalam, Blessed are you, Lord our God, who commanded us to light the Hanukkah candles. The Hanukkah candles came a thousand years after Moses. A th there's no word in the Torah it says about Hanukkah candles, but this is the point. Over here it says that the rabbis have an authority, they're bestowed upon God to give rulings, and it's as if, and it's as if it is, as God is speaking through them, working through them um, to, uh, to establish holidays. And therefore, you can say there are commandments, mitzvot, that are only from the rabbis. And that's why we can say, blessed are you, God, who commanded us to do such and such a thing. Even though God, you never, God didn't say that to Moses at the time of uh, Mount Sinai. Um, yeah, we have a lot of those things. We have on, on we have Shabbos, can, uh, Shabbos candles, we have, um, you know, Purim, all these other holidays that came afterwards. That's why we can say those brachas. Um, anyway, all that is from this week's Parsha. Okay, so let's get really, let's get into this week's Parsha. So the Parsha talks about setting up courts and kings, uh, courts and, uh, and, and those to enforce the law. Then the Torah deals with kingship. You, when you, when God, God says, when you go into the land of Israel, you will appoint yourself a king. When you will establish a king, the yeah, Barbara Nell says the fact that the, Gemara, the Torah is very medai. The Torah says, when you will establish a king, which means God didn't really want a king. Now, meaning God in his own didn't want a king, but because God wants us to be a partner in creation, yeah, that's a fundamental concept in Hasidus and Kabbalah. He wants us to be a partner. And if we come to God, just like in a healthy relationship of one spouse says, I want it done a certain way. <clears throat> it's healthy for the other one to see the other person's opinion and to uh, incorporate that and um, act upon that. So the fact that we wanted the king, we wanted the king, and God accepted that, and that's part of Torah. And to the extent <clears throat> that Mashiach is a king, that's exactly what Mashiach is. 
God accepted that and said, okay, the salvation, the whole culmination of everything that we're doing will come about through a king. Uh, there were good kings, there were bad kings. Yeah, the tribe of Yehuda and Benjamin had very, Benjamin and Yehuda, sometimes they had good kings and they had their fair share of corrupt kings. Um, so the Torah says, because God says, because the king is going to have so much power and he can really be taken away by his, uh, you know, taken off by his ego and what he can accomplish. So he, God set some ground rules. He said he can't have too many horses. Yeah, he can't have too many horses, like straight up in the Torah. In other words, you can't acquire too much possession. You can't marry more than a certain number of wives. And the number of wives, I know whenever I tell my wife this, she rolls her eyes, but 18, it's in today's parsha. Can't have more than 18. Um, 18 wives. There's a guy across the street from me, Ibrahim. Ibrahim. He's from Malaysia originally. He grew up in a mud hut, and uh, he'll tell me everything. Very intelligent person. He's a big engineer at, at General Motors. Just retired. He said that his father had, he goes, I had 19 brothers and sisters from four different mothers. <laughs> so he had, his father was married to four women. <clears throat> his father would say, I don't know why I married four women. Big mistake. <laughs> He's like, one is enough for me. He's a very funny guy. Yeah, so uh, we don't, uh, we don't, you're not allowed, uh, we have a tikkunah, uh, we have a tikkunah from uh, Rabbeinu Gershom. Yeah, some four, four or five hundred years ago, you're not allowed, Ashkenazi Jews are not allowed to marry more than one wife. And another tikkunah, by the way, is you're not allowed to open up someone else's mail. Uh, was another decree from Rabbeinu Gershom. So two of, I think, four decrees. One was you can't marry more than one wife, and you can't look at somebody else's mail. All right. Um, the Torah talks about in today's Parsha as well. Since the king, yeah, he can he has so much power and so much control, he has to write for himself a safer Torah. He has to write his own Torah. It was usually a small Torah, and he would have to carry it around with him everywhere he went. It was always opposite him. I think even when he slept, I believe. Um, it was always before him to know that you're nothing, you know, at the end of the day, you're nothing before the eyes of God and uh, make sure you stick to do what's right. Now, not only, not every king did what they were supposed to, despite the uh, Torah being in front of them. Um, if you come to our shul, sad to say, but sometimes I make jokes, even though the Torah is out. And I feel bad every time I do it. But I'm up on the bima and I make a joke. Whatever. Okay, chapter 18. Um, the Jews are not are warned. This is very interesting. The Jews are warned not to get into witchcraft and sorcery. The question is: Does witchcraft, black magic, are these true? Are these real, or are they not real? It is a machloikis. It's a difference of opinion. Rashi seems to hold that witchcraft and black magic is real, or it was real, as we'll find out. The Rambam holds that it was all mumbo jumbo. It doesn't uh, nobody actually ever had that? But Rashi, and it follows mo most opinion. Most people of, uh, are of the opinion that this idea of black magic and a witchcraft and sorcery really did exist. And the Torah warns about specific things called the yadoni. Yeah, sometimes a person would put a uh, uh, a bone in their mouth, and the bone would speak. They would do certain incantations, and the bone would speak. Um, it says about Bilam that he was when he was killed during the war. He was flying around like a witch. He was flying around, and they shot an arrow at him or something, and he died. And he obviously was killed. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, these Egyptians, they were sorcerers. That's why the golden calf became alive, right? They threw in their – how did this whole story of the golden calf – like, what ha actually happened? They threw in all their gold into the fire. That Everyone was throwing gold into the fire, and then all of a sudden this, like, calf came out. What a bizarre <laughs> – a walking, talking – Go, uh, cow, little cow. That's because the heir of Rav, who were the heir of Rav, this mixed multitude, they were the elite of Egypt as well as the sorcerers of Egypt. And they, were, they used sorcery to make the cow come alive. So it was real. Um, they were talking about the target gets into don't talk to the staffs, uh, the palm readers. Um, yeah, don't do that kind of stuff. Now we're, we're basically, we're going to hold to the opinion that it was true. That these things really, I know what happened. Why don't we see it anymore? The Torah says it doesn't exist anymore. The same, to, yeah, the, 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 the Gemara talks about black magic. You think someone does black magic and all that stuff? It's not true. It doesn't, that's not real anymore. Why? What happened? The whole idea of black, black magic gets its energy just like klipa. It all comes from the world of klipa, as you've heard me sit, talk about many times in Chassidus. Or sitra achra, as they would call it in, in, uh, in Aramaic, and the Zohar, sitra achra, the other side. 
Klipa is this concept of it hides over, it covers over, it, it, it believes it's its own, it, it sees its own existence. Yeah, it sees itself as its own separate existence, not an extension of godliness. Sound familiar? Yeah, because we all feel that. Because the body, to a certain extent, comes from Klipa. Klipa came into the world when Adam ate from the tree of good and evil by design, as we know. Klipa gets its energy if it's nothing of it itself. Klipa is a shell. A shell has no energy, has no life to itself. How does it stay alive? Through holiness, through Kedusha, by Elokos. It says, the, the Zara says, it's like a, it's like a king who throws uh, scraps behind his back. The little scraps, yeah, you have like little animals, so to speak, that will live off of that, those little tiny scraps. I remember there was a restaurant in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is where I grew up. You can get a box of bones for 25 cents. Basically, they would have all the chicken that I never ate there, but all the chicken, what came from, yeah, you want to pull chicken. So they would get off a bone. So they would scrape the bone to get all the chicken, and they would, they would throw the bones into another place. The bones had a little bit of uh, chicken on it. It's called a box of bones. You can get a box of bones, 25 cents. It was really for people who uh, couldn't, you know, obviously lived on the streets more or less. They could come and they could, they could eat that. Yeah, that's basically what it is. They live off this little tiny amount. That's what Klippa is. Now, they, they were able to suckle the Kedusha, the holiness that was given to Klippa, and use it out in any way they want. Now, it was a very powerful level of Kedusha, of holiness. What the rabbis decided was for paganism, like they would use it for paganism, yeah, idol worship. The rabbi said, we're going to do away with idol worship. It's too difficult for the Jewish people to deal with idol worship for paganism. So what did they do? I don't exactly know how they did this, but the Zohar talks about it. Uh, the Torah, um, well, the, the Gemara talks about it. It's elaborated in the Zohar. They diminished the light of Kedusha. How was it expressed? By the second temple, prophecy was only found by a very select few. Malachi, Zachariah, very few people experienced prophecy. If you go to Tzfas, you'll see in the burial places, there are a lot of caves. These like these little caves. And inside, they say they were prophets. These were prophets. But you, there's like hundreds of these prophets. There's so many of these little tiny caves. If you go to Tzfas, you'll see it. Because pro they, there was a but before, during the first base of Mikdash, and even before the first temple, and even before, there were thousands of prophets. Thousands of prophets. Everybody was on a highly spiritual state. The flip side of that, there was also a lot of idol worship. So what the rabbis decided to do was, we're going to diminish this intense godly revelation, divine revelation, which is going to stink in a certain way because we're going to have a lot less prophets, but we'll completely remove um, this yearning this desire for idol worship that's why nobody really has a desire for idol worship nowadays says the talmud so with that um that was one of the that was one of the bummers and the downside of, of idol worship but up until that period of time idol worship was a big deal and therefore god warned us not to get involved in uh, black magic and sorcery and witchcraft so today according to the torah those things don't exist whatsoever um that is talked about in this week's parsha it was able, oh, you get into this, this it, it, you were able to speak to the dead. This, they were able to like create these like mummy, mummies, these walking dead people. Um, and then the Torah moves on to uh, talking about the, once again, this idea of an Ari Mikva, someone who kills somebody by accident. Now there are two, there's not manslaughter. Manslaughter is also killing somebody by accident, but you were negligent. Yeah, that's why you're held liable. So that's called manslaughter. That is one level. Now there's someone who really kills somebody completely by accident. You know, fluke. So, whatever. I don't know. You can imagine what it is. Gum. You flick gum out of your mouth and it hits something, it hits something and it kills somebody. Like something insanely stupid. So it says the Torah, you have to go to what's called, I have to go to the Ari Miklat, the city of refuge, and you have to live there until the death of the Kohen Gadol. Because the Torah says, which is very hard for us to understand, um, but it's one of these things in Torah, and, and, and the Torah, Hasidus explains that it shows that there's some sort of pagam, there's some sort of blemish with your, there's some sort of blemish that something needs to be rectified. 
Um, and by the death of the Kohen Gadol, that's some sort of, that's like the kaparo. That is the way to rectify your soul. Again, it's very harsh. It's very difficult. And it doesn't mean when they went to the Ari Miklat, they were treated with love and respect. And um, they can, I believe the family can move there. And that, that's what they live. They live in these cities with the Lithium. And life was fine for them, but they had to be stuck there until the death of a Kohen Gadol. Sometimes these Kohanim Gadol live 50 years. You know, they could outlive your life. It's harsh, but, you know, that's just, we don't understand everything. Um, chapter 19 talks about don't move the boundary of your fellow's field. You can't move this boundary. It's called, uh, it's actually called stealing. Yeah, you have, yeah, you have your own property line. You can't push your property line back. And the rabbis extrapolate that this to mean that you're not allowed to have comp. It's stealing. It's like basically stealing money from your, yeah, you're losing land. You're stealing from it. The rabbis extrapolate this to mean that competition in business. You're not allowed to open up the same kind of restaurant right next to your fellow. Now you might say that in from neighborhoods and religious neighborhoods, especially in Israel, it's very often you'll see it. People want to open up bagel shops, two bagel shops within the same block or within two blocks. That's serious. You got to, the courts step in and say whether you can do that or not. And they have different ways of assessing. Is there something different about yours? What are you offering that's different? Da, da, da. And, they, and there's like serious problems. And how, how do they enforce it? They don't give, they don't allow anybody to give the hashkocha. You can't have a heksher on your restaurant and therefore nobody would eat by your restaurant. The big um, having competition, competition, the Torah very like limits competition within business. Uh, now it doesn't limit, it, it wants it, but it, you, there are very strict rules because you can't steal someone else's part also. If that's their way to make a living, what you, that's not for you to, to take it away from them. Um, then the, the Gemara moves on to something which is completely bizarre. It was the first thing I learned when I went to the Shiva. Edim Zoymimim. Edim Zoymimim are called false uh, witnesses. Um, well, they're called witnesses that are Zoymim. What is the case over here? Now, this would not, this is beyond logic. If two people say, I saw, uh, you know, Ruven and Shimon get, uh, kill one another, yeah, I saw Reuven, us two saw Reuven kill Shimon on uh, Tuesday. And then two other witnesses come and say to, uh, about us, the witnesses. That's impossible because you were with us that day at that moment. Because we, us, the witnesses, tried to kill, basically tried to put to death Reuven, because Reuven, we said Reuven killed Shimon, and therefore what's going to happen? We're going to kill, the courts will kill Reuven. Because we tried to kill, get Reuven killed, and we were just proved wrong by these other witnesses. That's not true. We get killed. We get whatever punishment we were trying to put upon somebody else. Now, these two other witnesses could totally be lying. <laughs> but the Torah says we follow the opinion of the next witnesses. If two other witnesses come and testify against you by saying that you were with us at that period of time, we get killed. Now, that's, whoa. Um, who kills us, by the way? If we were, yeah, we're the witnesses. Those two witnesses have to put us to death. And same thing, if we say that Ruvain was killed, you know, killed Shimon, we'd have to put Ruvain to death, which is why the Torah says, gives us a warning that if you're going to, um, if you see something, say something. Meaning, you might be, you see somebody killing somebody else and you don't want to, turn them into the courts. Why don't you want to turn them into the courts? Because you might be the one that you have to carry out the punishment and kill them. That's very hard. If you're like a meek person, that's very, you know, not strong and scared. And I have to go and like kill this person that I saw kill somebody else. The Torah gives you a, a blessing and warns you, but it's a, it's a way of strength that don't worry. I'll don't be afraid to come to court to tell people that you, you see something, you saw something, you have to say something. Um, even though you're going to be the one that carries out the punishment. So the Torah gets into what's called an Edim Zaymimim. Again, it's one of these mitzvahs, just like kosher. It doesn't make any sense. Um, Torah talks about drafting into the army, um, which is a hot topic today in the land of Israel. Everybody who, yeah, they have a draft in the army in Israel. And uh, Charedim, the Frum crowd, does everything it can not to go into the army, right? So they'll say, we're learning Torah, and therefore we can't go into the army, they find a way, yeah, we don't believe in going to the army. And it's obviously, it makes the Israeli government very upset. The Rebbe's opinion, I'm a Chabad Chassid, so therefore you're going to hear the Rebbe's opinion, our Rebbe's opinion, 
was that if you're really diligent in learning and genuine in learning Torah, you should not go to the army. But if you're not, you should go to the army. And in fact, there's a holiness to going to the army because you're protecting Jewish lives. As the Pusik says, is your, is your blood not as red as their blood, which I, kind of became a famous line nowadays. You, um, you have an obligation to go and protect the, the Jewish people. And, and the source, the Rebbe would say, the, the merit of being able to save a Jewish life. Is, um, so the Rebbe would also emphasize that there are ruchnias, there are physical battles, and there are spiritual battles. And you need both. And to find someone to fight a, a physical battle is not so difficult. But to find someone who's going to really dedicate their lives to a spiritual battle, they're few and far between. They really, they really are not that many. Not as many as you. We, we, we may make a lot of noise, but we're very, very small. Um, what else is it getting? Okay, that's pretty much the end of the, uh, the, end of the Parsha. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Um, I have a quick question. Um, the rule regarding how many horses you're allowed to own, does that only apply to the king or does it apply to everyone? And how many horses is it? It, was, it applied to the king and I think it was 70 horses. And they couldn't be from the land of Egypt, I think. I think that was what I read today. Couldn't be from the land of Egypt. Nowadays, it could be from the land of Egypt, but at the time. And it only applies to the king. That's correct. Only applies to the king. The king was not very wealthy. Like, they would do everything they can to make sure the king was not uh, very wealthy. Now, the king can go ahead and do whatever he wants. Um, but good question. King David only, the King David only had six wives, by the way. Only had six. Uh, King Solomon married a lot and then divorced. Just to uh, why? Why did he do that? What was what was King Solomon trying to do? Right, the son of King David. He was actually preparing the world for he. He was preparing the world for Mashiach. He was trying to convert. He was trying to get. He was trying to populate and convert. People were coming to him. They wanted to become Jewish. He wasn't doing it because um, you know he was. He had like certain desires. I don't even think he did it like that. Um, he would convert. It was like a way of conversion and, and having, I, I don't actually know like all the details. I should really look into it, but um, he did it for holy reasons. Ultimately, Mashiach did not come at the time, although the, the, the moon was never diminished during the era of King Solomon. You know that? It was always a full moon. I don't know what happened with the oceans, but that's what the Torah says. So that really happened. Um, anybody else have any questions? So once again, it is... Uh, it is the month of El, it's an opportune time to connect with the king. And as we know, the Rebbe says the way, the best way to connect with the king, to connect, to take an opportunity is to emulate the king. You emulate the king, God reciprocates. It acts in the same way as you. Um, so we know that the king is receiving everybody joyfully, everybody and anybody, everybody and anybody, any type of person from any situation, any, wherever they are, he warmly, and um, with words of encouragement and uh, you embrace them, God will do the same for you. And that's the best preparation you can have for Rosh Hashanah. All right, I'll see you all tonight. If you have any questions, obviously text me. Chodesh Tov, everybody. Chodesh Tov, should be a good month.